Hello, my name is Monica Kretschmer, and I'm the founder and CEO of the Universal Women's Network, Women of Inspiration Awards, and this is our Women Driving Change panel. We're super excited to have such an esteemed panel of leaders with us today from diverse industries. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panel and get started. Uh, first off, we have Desiree Bomino, who is the CEO and Chief Disruption Officer with SureCall. Next, Katie Duchek. Executive Vice President, Regional Bank RBC, Andrea Linger, Raymond James Linger, Raymond James Limited, and also the head of the Women Canadian Advisory Network. Debbie Renaggi is the Senior Managing Director of FTI Consulting. And ladies, we are ready for an amazing panel today. Before we begin our panel, I would love each of our um, leaders to just share a little bit about your journey um, and introduce yourself. So Desiree, would you like to lead us off? Thank you, Monica. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, excited to uh, participate in this panel with all these uh, wonderful ladies. Um, yeah, so my journey has been a long one. I've been in uh, business uh, for just over uh, 33 years. Um, I founded uh, my own company uh, back 30 years ago, and we pivoted into a brand new company in 2013, SureCall. Uh, SureCall is a global BPO, business process optimization company. Uh, we have uh, global clients, and uh, it's growing really, really quickly right now. Um, lots going on. We uh, pivoted in 2013 to a purpose over profit driven organization. Um, that all started with um, <clears throat> excuse me, my journey uh, in 2017. Um, I, I was invited to Harvard uh, to become a Harvard Fellow um, in the Advanced Leadership Initiative, and we were uh, focusing on critical humanitarian issues around the world. I created uh, the Hero Girls Empowerment Program, which offers scholarships um, and uh, focus groups and uh, microloans to mothers groups. We put through about uh, 110 girls a year through the program, and they also go through an empowerment program, entrepreneurial program, and they all create and design a innovation project that's launched um, every year. And it just empowers uh, these girls to find self-efficacy and uh, understand their worth um, in their, these villages around the world. So that's a little bit about me and what I do. And again, uh, appreciate uh, being on the panel today. Thank you so much, Desiree. And like I said, this panel is amazing. You have so much to offer um, and words of wisdom. We're looking forward to your contribution today. Next, um, with Katie Duchek, I'll have you uh, take the stage. Thank you, Monica. It is an honor to be here with all of you. I, um, I'm a parent of four incredible kids. Um, I've been with RBC for almost 35 years. Um, I have the privilege in my day job of leading distribution strategies and leading over 20,000 20, frontline advisors across the country from commercial bankers and corporate bankers to, to branch bankers. Um, and, uh, and it is an incredibly transformational time given the impacts of data and digital and uh, how it's impacting the world. RBC is a purpose-led organization. Helping clients thrive and communities prosper is what we live for. And uh, my personal purpose is really to, to build, uh, my professional purpose is really to ensure relevance of our human advisors because I believe they are a core differentiator. My personal purpose is really to build a, a more inclusive and kinder world given my own life experiences. I'm a child of post-war newcomers to Canada. I'm a child that, or I was a child that experienced learning disabilities in school. And I'm a woman with gender transition experience, if you've read my profile in Monica's amazing book. So that's a little bit about me. And again, I'm looking forward to the conversation today. And Monica, thank you for bringing such an incredible group together. Thank you so much, Katie. We are super excited to have you. And this is the book Katie was talking about, The Woman of Inspiration, Woman Driving Change. And all of you leaders are in this amazing book. So we'll talk more about that at the end. But um, super excited to have you. Thank you, Katie. And Andrea. 
Thank you so much, Monica. I uh, really appreciate being on the panel today with all of these wonderful women. Um, a little bit about me. I am a mom of four. I uh, have been with Raymond James uh, for 10 years now. It's my 10-year anniversary, actually, this year. And um, my background, actually, uh, before that, I was uh, part of my family's business. So I was raised in a very entrepreneurial family. Uh, we have had a few businesses, but our longest one um, is one in Victoria, which is on Vancouver Island for the last 25 years. Um, so I spent a lot of time in the family business. Uh, and then at Raymond James, I head up a national department called Practice Management, where we uh, basically help our advisors build and grow their businesses. And then I'm also head of the Women Canadian Advisors Network uh, for Canada, uh, so my mission there is to help support our female advisors in the growth and development um, and education uh, side of their business as well. And then I sit on our uh, global uh, women's council and uh, our, local, our national uh, diversity and inclusion council as well. So I'm very passionate about the uh, diversity and inclusion field. Uh, and, you know, it's my personal goal to help um, women excel. Um, you know, I've got three daughters, so I want to make it a world where they don't have to, you know, overcome some of the barriers that our mothers have or grandmothers have had to do in ourselves. Um, so that's what I'm very passionate about. Thank you again. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. And I know that you have a big mission with Raymond James as well, um, you know, 20 by 25, 2025. 20, um, 25 by 25. <laughs> 25 by 25. <laughs> yeah. Great. Right? Um, so, uh, really great to have your leadership today and happy for you to be able to join us. Um, Debbie. Thank you, Monica, and a pleasure being here with everybody as well. So, I'm Debbie Rajani. I'm a Senior Managing Director at FTI Consulting. FTI Consulting is a global advisory firm. We have over 6,000 employees around the world and have um, off various offices in Canada. I've spent most of my career uh, working in corporate restructuring and more specifically corporate restructuring in Latin America. So actually most of my clients and most of my work um, is in Mexico or in, in South America. So Chile, Brazil, uh, was even part of the restructuring of um, the country of Barbados a few years back. So I um, have, have a lot of varied industries and expertise in my field. Um, you know, I do come from a parent of immigrants. We came to Canada in 1989. I am half uh, Venezuelan and half East Indian, um, so I also have a mixed background. And so I think my story and my m moving countries and places, because we first immigrated to Edmonton and then settled in Ottawa and then now I reside in Toronto, has helped shape my leadership and where my career is today. Um, and one of my purposes, as other ladies have shared, is to uh, mentor others and really especially specifically women, um, you know, to give them the tools and advice of anything that I've learned and even just learning from them, I find sometimes even mentoring younger folks, like they actually have a lot for us to learn from as well. So um, that's my you know, personal goal, and at FTI, I carry that out as well, working with our FTI Women's Initiative, and also I'm part of a global steering committee on diversity and inclusion, also passionate about that as well, given my uh, mixed background. So thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, thank you so much, Debbie. And, you know, when the world stopped, women kept going. Women from around the world, we're deeply impacted. Of course, we each touch so many women in our own networks and communities. We know that women are the driving change in our workplace and our communities and the economy. But now is a time more than ever for us to collectively use our voices to make change. So my question for the panel today is how can women utilize this time to stand out from the crowd, get on board, start businesses and make an impact? Desiree. Well, that's a loaded question. There's lots there. Um, I think, you know, it's important that we can't give, you know, let up on the mission, right, um, to move women forward in business and in organizations. Women on boards is great, but I feel like it's become like checking a box, um, not really about uh, looking at the value that women bring uh, to the table. Um, we know that World Economic Forum released research that sh proves that women in leadership roles actually increase profitability, increase diversity, increase creativity uh, to any organization, uh, you know, by putting them in these leadership roles. So these barriers have to come down, and it means not sitting back 
uh, at any time. Um, I feel like if we get comfortable, um, we're going to be in big trouble. So even though there's, like you said, Monica, great, great strides being made, it, it's it's like um, turning a aircraft carrier. It's moving at glacial speed. Um, we need to um, keep pushing forward for, for this to happen. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Desiree. And Katie, how about yourself? Um, I think we're at a pivotal time in history. Um, firstly, I building on Desiree's point, I think the pandemic has exposed certainly risks for women, um, but it's also exposed, I think, the unique gifts that women have available to them, the unique powers we have available to us to transform, to transform the world. So much of the business world has been programmed, especially the corporate world, through more of a left brain, cerebral, methodical approach and generally, women bring other attributes beyond that, creativity, a nurturing ability, a principles-based ability. I think we see that in women leaders like Jacinta, the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who I just think is an incredible individual. So my, my hope is that we realize that we have a unique power in the gifts that we were given to bring more to the business world. Um, many of us are choosing to be entrepreneurs and go out on our own because we want out of that corporate world. And some of us are blazing trails within that corporate world. Whichever you choose, um, I really do think it's a pivotal time where um, being the women that we are brings so much to the equation um, and something that we should claim with pride. And uh, so I'm, I'm quite optimistic about where we're at, recognizing there are some risks and we cannot allow those women that are marginalized to be left behind. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Katie. And Andrea, how can we use this time now to make an impact and stand out from the crowd? Well, you know, Desiree and Katie have both um, outlined quite a few things that we need to consider. And I would have to say, from my, from my standpoint, too, I think the focus on our younger generation of women coming up is also very important. Um, you know, there still is somewhat of a limiting mindset out there. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, for whatever reason, uh, they are at times still facing some of the barriers that we're going to face. You know, whether it's wage inequity, um, it's the, you know, how do you have a family and balance a career, uh, you know, that is getting better um, each generation. But I do think that there's still um, supports that we could put in place for our young women to teach them that it's okay to stand up, to say, you know, I want that. Um, it's okay for them to negotiate a fair salary, but first they have to learn how to negotiate. You know, um, I think that there's a lot of things that we could be doing to help mentor our younger generations, uh, especially for those of us that are in the corporate world or we're on, you know, entrepreneurs. Um, I think as it's our responsibility as female leaders to take that initiative, take some young women under our wing and raise them up with us as we go along in our journey. Beautiful. Thank you for the insight, Sandria. And Debbie, how can we use this time to make an impact and stand out from the crowd? I mean, I think building on what everybody has said so far, I think, you know, getting the confidence instilled in women, you know, young women, I think will help achieve all the things that we're talking about, right? That to be able to negotiate a better salary, stand up for yourself, for what you want. And, you know, this idea of having it all, you know, it's, we don't have to have it all, right? We can choose what we want. And I think it actually puts extra pressure on women to say that we have to be mothers. We have to do this. We have to have a career. We, you know, we can choose what we want, right? If you want a career, if you want a family life, and that it's okay to be, you know, a stay-at-home mom, and that's what you choose to be, and be confident in that and own that. So I think, you know, as Katie has mentioned, this is a pivotal time where at least, you know, I think things are much better than, than uh, latter generations, but obviously we still have a lot of room to grow. But it is a time that there is a lot of focus on women, right, on diversity, on the different aspects. So this is a time to really grow where the attention is there. And where we already have some female leaders 
in place to then continue and hopefully like snowball that, right? So it's been sort of trickling up, but hopefully we can get it to that we get we have enough momentum now that we can just really snowball and not reach. And I think there was some study that it's going to take 100 years for women's uh, wages to become parity with men. I think it was the World Economic Forum. Like, I mean, I hope that it doesn't take 100 years. Like, my God, I hope that we can achieve that in the next 20, 10, 20 years. There's no reason why it should take that long, right? And I couldn't agree more. Look what we've accomplished when the world turned overnight on us, what we were able to achieve. I think 100 years was you know, we can for sure achieve that within our lifetimes. You know, I think we just have to be vocal about it and take action. So thank you so much, Debbie. Um, my next question actually leads into a little bit further on all of the impact that you're making in your own communities, in your industries, in your networks. Desiree, what was the turning point or experience that really ignited your leadership voice to drive change? Well, if we're talking about, I think I'll, I'll stick with talking about business here. I mean, obviously, there's been many turning points in our lives uh, personally, you know, uh, through hardship and other things that we've had. I had a very disappointing childhood um, with a lot of abuse um, that took place when I was younger and, in fact, had to eventually, um, the turning point for me with regards to finding my voice was uh, the, the ability to have my father put in jail. And so that, you know, from a personal perspective, made me a very strong individual. But from a business perspective, I would have to say that, you know, I've always had something to say. I realized that people were listening, too. And once you realize that people are listening and you have the right thing to say, um, you should really make sure that that narrative gets out. And I think women don't do that often enough. Uh, it's incumbent upon us to sort of pave the way, I feel, and make it easier for women who are coming up through leadership. Uh, so I spend a lot of my time trying to do that, um, you know, especially after the dev devastating impact uh, to female leaders and entrepreneurs through the pandemic. Women have so much to contribute, and they should not take a back seat when they, when they can share what they know. I think we have to stop feeling like we're taking up air. Um, we've been ignored for so long that we just don't bother saying it out loud anymore. And I think we need to stop that. Beautiful. Take up space. I actually have a mug that says take up space. Like just own it, right? It's so important. Thank you so much, Desiree. Uh, Katie, how about yourself? What's that turning point that ignited your leadership to drive change? Um. Professionally, I've had many turning points in my career where you just learn and grow so quickly. But I'll, I'll, I'll touch base actually, Monica, on two, building on Desiree's point. So growing up in a home with a lot of trauma, therefore yelling and you know difficulty as a child, and then growing up with learning challenges in school, um, I, in my late teens, I became exceptionally determined. And I already had gender issues. I already felt more girl or related to girls at five years old. So my gender issues were not new recently. It was with me for 50 years. What was the turning point at that point in my late teens was as I became fiercely determined to build a better life than my parents, to prove to my parents that I wasn't lazy, that I was capable, and to prove to those teachers that I wasn't dumb and that I was smart enough. And that determination served me exceptionally well to be a different and unique leader um, within our company. Um, the next turning point is what happened in June of 2019. Yet coming out to the world as the whole me, not just half of me, um, was a remarkable experience um, because I expected to be homeless. I expected to be rejected by the world. And what I received was an extraordinary level of love and kindness from thousands of people. And what I received, and this is a uniquely, not uniquely, but women tend to show more sensitivity and vulnerability than men. And by me showing my vulnerability of coming out, I received hundreds and thousands of emails where other people 
were sharing me their hurts and their struggles and their journeys. And what I realized through that was that all we really see, and I kind of knew it, but I didn't know the magnitude of it, is that what we see at work is the tip of the iceberg. We just want the person to do their job. When the reality is there's so much richness to the human experiences that our employees bring, men, visible minority, indigenous, LGBT, um, and obviously women, and the corporate world was built on not sharing those human aspects of ourselves and those struggles of ourselves. But ironically, those human elements are actually what makes so many people beautiful. And, and um, I felt like I had a sneak peek on Black Lives Matter and the level of hurt that was being carried around. And I have such a deep passion today, given my experience, for inclusion. And when I say inclusion, I mean psychological safety, connection, belonging, being heard, being respected, not just as the worker, but as the whole human being, as the whole woman. Um, because what comes with it is so much creative potential and potential productivity. Yes, it's a human rights issue. Every human being deserves to bring their whole self to society and to what they do, their family, their career. But the untapped creativity and potential that exists because people are holding back, women are holding back because of fear um, is unacceptable in today's world. So I, I've had a couple of big turning points. The first one served me well in terms of determination. But the second one, I think, hopefully has the potential to serve the world better by helping you know, helping us all drive change and build a much kinder, more inclusive world. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing, Katie. And I do have to say what's, you know, kind of coming up in the themes is, is that personal and that professional drive. It, it, it's not either or, it's and, right? So that's really important. Thank you so much. And Andrea, what was that turning point for you um, where you chose to ignite your leadership to drive change? I would have to say the biggest um, biggest time that I, you know, had to make a change was when I actually decided to leave the family business and go back to school when I was 30 uh, with uh, very small children <laughs> uh, and also get divorced at the same time. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend doing that. But, um, you know, for me, I, I had to spread my wings. I had to prove to myself that I wasn't, or that I was capable, and it wasn't just because I worked for my family. And so, um, you know, I spread my wings. I went back to school. Uh, you know, graduated with distinction, and um, and then I, the next turning point for me was when I made the list of all of the successful women that I knew, and I asked the first person on the list to go for lunch. Um, just so that I could figure out how did she get so successful. Uh, and I ended up going to work for her. And um, that's how I got into the financial services industry. And it's been an interesting 10 years. You know, um, I started as an admin assistant and worked my way up in the corporate world um, to now heading up a national department. And so, you know, I, I think it's a matter of just... Uh, embracing those pivotal moments uh, and seeing where they can take you. Um, you know, I think that's that's the key. And and then encouraging others to embrace their pivotal moments. I think you know um, that's important too. Especially, I see sometimes women they don't want to speak up, they don't want to stand out, they don't want to ask. Um, you have to encourage them to do that. And you know, I used to be one of those. My mentor, she's the one that encouraged me, speak up, ask for what you want. Um, and so, you know, I am who I am today because I had those wonderful people in my back um, behind me, pushing me a little bit, saying, hey, <laughs> step up and speak out. Beautiful. And I am a firm believer that you really only need that one person to believe in you. And you can 
change the world. Like it's the belief of somebody believing in you um, that's game changing. So thank you very much, Andrea. And Debbie, what was that turning point for you? Um, so I would say it actually builds on what you were saying, Monica and Andrea, of people believing in you. Um, you know, I've always been an outspoken person. I was just taught by my parents. My sister and I are both very assertive, <laughs> very assertive women and always like to speak our minds. Um, and, you know, as joining the corporate world, you sort of, you find your footing on that, right? You need to sometimes tone it down and sometimes you do need to speak up. Um, and so finding my way through the career is that, you know, about five or six years ago, I started noticing that people started noticing that they believed in me. And I got asked to like to develop, you know, join the diversity and inclusion. I got asked to start leading the Win STI Women's Initiative. And so within within Canada, and I ended up also then meeting a lot of leaders in the U.S. across, just because I was interested in like uh, helping learning and development. So I would help do the courses where we trained our internal staff, and I would volunteer just because that's what I like to do. And it was just kind of doing my own thing without realizing what I was really doing in terms of networking, of raising my profile sort of informally mentoring people through this coaching and teaching. Um, and then, you know, two years ago, uh, my my supporters, my boss and his boss, basically were like, Debbie, you're ready for a promotion. And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. I don't, you know, I'm happy where I am. They're like, no, Debbie, you can do it. You know, because an SMD in our world is equivalent to like a partner in a law firm or the accounting firms, right? Uh, we're, we're a public company, so there is no partnership. But it is a big promotion to go up. And I actually was like, no, I don't want it, I'm good. And it's like I had people believe in me beyond my boss and even other people in the company that they were like, no, you're ready for this. You can do it. This We believe in you. So that was sort of the turning point that, wow, people believe in me more than I do myself, right, which is kind of crazy. And so now in these last two years, you know, it's building that self-confidence and knowing that people do look up to me or that I can affect change. Right. I recently actually helped get our benefits changed for the better in the Canadian office. And so that was just something that, like I just before might have been like, yeah, okay, well, we need to change this or whatnot, but actually believing in myself that, you know, people do want to hear what I want to say and what thoughts I have and, you know, to make change. So Beautiful. And this is a wonderful segue into the next question that I have about imposter syndrome. So according to recent reviews, of course, 70 5% of women experience imposter syndrome at some point of their career. It manifests itself in self-doubt, fear of success, fear of failure, self-sabotage, and this is regardless of the level of success that we've achieved. So my question to you, Desiree, is have you ever experienced it and how have you overcome it if you have experienced it? Yeah, um, the statistic is probably more like 90%. Um, you know, many women don't want to talk about that or admit it um, uh, because it's not just self-doubt. It's also a guilt of sometimes, believe it or not, of achieving so much. And sometimes it's easier, um, you know, than you think it should be to achieve something. So I've had imposter syndrome since day one. I still have it today where, you know, I think I don't deserve the accolades that I receive. Um, I try to give, you know, the success away. I, I give it away to my team, to my husband, to my family, everyone else but me. Uh, and I realize that although those people have been very impactful and I share my successes with all of them, I think we also have to stop denying the fact that we can do amazing things as women um, because we know it will be hard. We go into it with that boundless determination, and it's something that's very innate to us. And I think we don't realize that we have that capacity. And, you know, sort of like Debbie was saying, you know, it was she realized it when everybody else was letting her know that she had it. And I still suffer from, from that very much. I mean, the, the amount of awards and accolades I've won over the last five years is is like ridiculous, honestly. And I, I still sit there and I go, no, this is, you know, this is, this isn't me. This is this, they've made a mistake, you know, that sort of thing. But I think we have to start to sort of accept that we can do incredible things as women, and we should be okay with being recognized for that. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Desiree. And we will talk about that a little bit later about why it's so uncomfortable to step into the spotlight. And you're correct, you're bang on, we need to have more women step into the spotlight, own their worth. So thank you so much. And Katie, 
Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome? When the question should be, when haven't I? So um, I've felt like something's broken in me or I'm not good enough for my entire life in spite of the cover of my book being determined and driven and, you know, assertive. Um, I can't think of a time in my life where I felt like I fit in or that I didn't feel imposter syndrome. I remember in 2005, after, to Debbie's point, after receiving a promotion, in my car with my coach in tears saying, I don't deserve this. They're going to figure me out. When are they going to figure me out? Um, and she says, you may not, my coach said, you may not think you deserve it, which is a sign of humility, but you don't deserve it any less. And that was a real pivot point for me of looking at it the opposite way and say, you may be humble because you've been marginalized, you've been told you're second class, you feel like you're second class as a woman or as a marginalized child. And that's got a humility effect to it, which is not a bad thing, but you don't deserve it any less. And that was quite a turning point and quite an inspiring point for me. But um, all the women on my team and a few of the men that have been through struggles all carry imposter syndrome. And overcoming that is critical to building confidence mm -hmm. and assertiveness, especially at more senior levels. Beautiful. Thank you. And I have to say that those listeners that are in the viewers that are going to be absorbing all of the wisdom are going to be relieved to hear. They're not alone. They're not alone. They're not alone. Thank you, Katie. So Andrea, how about yourself? Imposter syndrome? I have to echo Katie. Um, <laughs> it should be uh, when no two suffer from it. Uh, you know, of course I've suffered from it. Absolutely. I mean, I remember um, having to go up on stage at our annual women's uh, symposium when we were back in person and actually having large gatherings. Um, and I was like, uh, why, why am I going up in, on stage in front of 700 women, you know? Um, and Monica, you know this firsthand that I suffered from uh, imposter syndrome when I was nominated for a Women of Inspiration Award. And I actually contemplated not submitting my application uh, because I was like, I, what am I going to put in my application? What, why would I be um, a woman of inspiration? So Monica had to talk me off the ledge on that one. <laughs> but I think the biggest thing with imposter syndrome is Absolutely, we suffer from it, but it does help if you actually acknowledge it out loud to someone who you trust, who knows who you are, and can talk you off that ledge and say, hey, you know what? You do deserve it. You are worthwhile. Um, you have all of these accomplishments. Now go out and grab them and then embrace them. And so I think that makes a big difference. Mm. Beautiful. Well, I'm happy to walk anybody off the ledge because that's, I truly see the value with that every voice brings to the table. And so often women are so busy working and building and growing and making an impact. They have no idea of the ripple effect. And so that's why it is so, so very important. So thank you very much, Andrea, for sharing. Um, Debbie. Um, this was a question that you said, I would love to answer this. Um, so I'd love to hear your answer to, have you first experienced imposter syndrome? And if you have, how have you overcome it? Yes, I experienced it. I mean, all the time. I think it's hopefully getting a little bit better <laughs> as I progress, right? Because all of this that we're talking about, it's not like we've achieved per perfection where we are, right? This is like a learning process. It's a growing process. Like we're just evolving and learning more and more. So I mean, I often feel it when I'm on big deals, you know, there's these lawyers, there'll be like investment bankers, whatnot, and they're all talking, and sometimes I just sit there and I'm like, I have no idea what's going on, or think I don't have an idea of what's going on, and feel like I don't belong here, like I shouldn't be doing this, like, you know, and so you kind of, it's like that self-confidence, and it's realizing that, no, you've gotten to where you are because you do have some brains, right, you have some smarts, you've developed skills, you can handle it, you're not in the position that you're in, 
you know, sometimes you feel overwhelmed and that's fine, but you are where you are because you can handle it and because people see that in you. So I think it's important to realize that and just take a deep breath. I, I do try to do a lot of yoga and I feel like why I enjoy yoga so much is because I am such a type A personality and I'm always like go, 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 that yoga forces me to slow down, right, and breathe. Um, and so that's oftentimes what, you know, you need to do when you're at work or when you're stressed out about something or feeling overwhelmed. It's like, breathe, you've got this. What are the skills I've got? And what can I, you know, bring to the table? And I agree in having some, you know, speaking to somebody I've had, I've spoken to my boss being like, you're going to figure, like, I don't know as much as you think I know. I really don't know what's going on. He's like, you're fine. It's fine. You know what you're doing, right? And it's having that, like, repetitive somebody else tell you, it sort of helps build your confidence and, you know, know that you can do it. So it's one step at a time, right? You always have to just take it one step, but it's knowing and being confident in your ability that you can handle the situation you're in. Beautiful. Well said, Debbie. And so that's really a nice segue in. We don't do it alone. Um, you know, our, everyone plays a role to support in Champion for Women. Our allies play an important role in our homes, but also in the workplace. So Desiree, why is it so important for men and our allies to be part of the conversation? Well, we share the planet with men. <laughs> and um, I think it, it's, it's important for them to uh, be part of the conversation because they contribute as much as we do. They really do. It, you know, it's different and, you know, it's, it's not, it's in different ways, um, but they are a, a partnership with us uh, in the world of business. And I think that uh, they're great allies to have, great support system uh, to have. Um, and great contributors to success. I mean, you know, my partner, Mark, is uh, my husband and my partner in business, and he is my biggest fan and my biggest supporter. And I think they, you know, men have to be part of the solution when it comes to how we raise our children, our, our girls and our boys, and help them to understand that it's okay to be caring, creative, and nurturing. It's part of uh, being a great leader. And when men help us in unison um, share that perspective with our children, um, it's very powerful. Um, so that's, you know, that's where I feel uh, they contribute the most is in helping us in our business with our teams, uh, showing that unified front, but also with what they, um, you know, uh, what they, how they help us transform our children. Beautiful. And Mark was actually, he's also in the Woman of Inspiration book as well. We have like a handful of men and he's definitely a support her. Um, and that's a really important role where we have men in the roles where they stand up and say, how can we support and champion for women? So um, thank you very, very much, Desiree. Um, Katie, so you have some interesting perspectives on I this do. front. <laughs> I do. Um, Firstly, I'll, I'll share with you a personal story, and then I'll give you my perspective on why men have to be part of this conversation. And it's a bit different um, than what we typically talk about. So firstly, my personal story is when I came out um, in June of 2019, the February before, I met with the most senior person in the company, our CEO, to tell him my truth. And later that night, I texted him after crying in his office for an hour straight about my who I really am as a person and as a woman. Um, and I just thanked him for you know getting me Kleenex and being compassionate. And um, you don't normally text the CEO, but I did. And he replied back to me and he says, wow, Katie, I cannot get over your courage, which I did it to save my life. Like that's the reality. Two, Katie, I've got a lot to learn, which is humility. And three, RBC's got your back. RBC is with you. Um, and it was the latter that I needed to hear. I needed to feel accepted as a woman and supported. Um, I was prepared to leave the company if that's what happened. That consideration never came about. So there was in, in the moment, in, in an intense moment in time, he showed up as the exact kind of caring, compassionate human being you would want your CEO to be. Um, secondly, I think we need to find ways to include men in these conversations. Um, I've seen the inside of the locker room 
and I've heard some horrific old style guys guys conversations about women um, that I found appalling because I never felt like I fit in that world. I was never wired that way. I may have tried to fit in, but I never felt like I fit. And I've heard some appalling things based on men's view of how women are made. They're not strategic. They lack business acumen. Um, you know, they're having children set you back and therefore tough luck. Um, I've heard all kinds of horrific examples. And then on the other hand, I've worked with many men that are incredible human beings. And, you know, by creating a safe space for those men to show their sensitivity and show their vulnerability and their creativity, they become more powerful leaders because we're helping them step out of the traditional business norm that I talked about earlier, which is left brain, linear, cerebral, disciplined, and, and allowing them to be more creative and more expressive and more sensitive and more emotional because that's not how they were developed. And so I, I think we've got to bring more men into the conversation, one, to help them see their own biases around how they're raised. They're not terrible people. They've just been raised with certain biases. And the more we bring them in and help them see that, um, the more embracing they will be of us because they'll realize the bias that exists. But I also think it's also about helping them be their whole self as well. Um, and, uh, and just realize that the business world in many cases, especially professional services and banking, um, you know, that the way that it's traditionally operated from a style perspective isn't the only way it could operate, that there are so many other skills and behaviors that you can bring in to make the world and the company so much richer. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much, Katie, for sharing those two very valuable perspectives. Um, I, I think that we need to actually have a whole entire um, half day, full day, week, month conversation about this. Like this is just the tip of the iceberg. So um, I look forward to um, continuing that conversation with you and with everyone about that. So that's how we can drive change. Thank you. Um, Andrea, why is it important for men to be a part of the conversation? Well, um, there is no one right way to do things. And you know, men can be fantastic supporters. They have a different way of looking at things. Uh, sometimes, and they have valuable opinions and thoughts, and the, and I think we're stronger if we actually work together, because we bring the best of both um, to 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 find a solution, right? Um, yes, maybe they think li more linear, and we are more compassionate. But if you combine those two together, the results are going to be amazing. And so, you know, I've been fortunate to have a number of fantastic supporters in my life, you know, my dad, my brother, my husband, um, and even some fabulous men at Raymond James. Um, you know, and it's good for women to actually gain a different perspective sometimes, too. Um, you know, I think that in order for us to... Um, really find the solutions that we need to the problems that we're all facing, you know, in the world, we have to come together and there has to be uh, both sides of the table talking together to find that solution and, and carrying off each other's strengths, really, you know, because um, we all bring something unique and different. And there's more than one way to get to the answer, you know, um, so yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Andrea. And Debbie, why is it important for men to be part of that conversation? Well, I think as everybody has said, it's so important because they're the ones that are really going to help us make the change. I mean, in some sense, we can keep talking to each other about how great women are, how amazing we are, what everything we can do. But ultimately, there are more men in the leadership roles and in powerful roles so that we need really their help and their buy-in to make the change happen, right? So I think they need to be a part of these conversations to, you know, educate them, understand their biases, as Katie was saying, um, so that we can then come together and, as Andrew was saying, work together to make the best 
you know, take the best from both everybody, each person's individuality, and put that together forward at the business or even in society, right? I mean, it's got to be, have to be a societal change. I mean, businesses, I think, we're trying to drive the change because that's where it can happen. But ultimately, this is not on RBC or on Raymond James or on FTI to make this. This is a societal shift that has to happen right across the world and maybe hopefully starting in countries or whatnot. Um, so I think that's why they're so vital to the um, transformation in our uh, growth. Um, I know I've had also very many supporters. All you know, at work, it's all been male colleagues that have um, supported me and you know, promote helped me get promoted or whatnot. And personally, my husband, you know, we have very untraditional roles, as you would say. Like, um, I am the breadwinner at home. Uh, my husband does work, but he also takes care of everything in the house. So he washes the dishes, he does the cooking. So it's a very reverse role that, you know, sometimes people will make fun of him for, right? But that's how our relationship works and that's how he supports me and our family uh, coming together and having that different sort of balance, right? Because most men are not the ones doing the dishes, doing cooking and cleaning and all that, right? It's, it's a way, again, to shift society because it can be different. Like even my sister, um, when she went on maternity leave, her husband, uh, he had better benefits. So he's the one who really took the fraternity leave. And I, I felt bad for him because he would go with my nephew to these play groups and it was all women and just him, right? And so that doesn't then help foster the societal change that women and men both need to, you know, take care of families because he then felt isolated. He couldn't connect with anybody. And, you know, there was less than, if there's not enough men doing that, taking the equal roles, right, and or supporting raising children, then it's just... It's going to make it slower for us women if we want to take leadership roles or be more involved in our careers for that to happen. Beautiful. What great perspectives, ladies, all of you. Um, thank you so much for contributing your leadership and your wisdom. Um, I have one final question as we wrap up our Women Driving Change panel. Real quickly, how are you each going to be driving change in your industry? Desiree. Well, my industry is over 100 years old, and uh, it actually, um, the industry is full of women. I mean, uh, women uh, are, are the front line for BPO work, and how I'm trying to drive change is to move women off the front line and back up into leadership uh, within our industry. It's always been where women have done the work and uh, the males have taken the accolades at the top. And so we've uh, very much uh, been a leader in, in our industry and sort of turned the pyramid upside down and uh, um, helped to support and mentor women uh, through leadership programs in our industry to show them that they can run BPOs, they can um, foster global uh, international uh, companies, and that they can create partnerships with clients all over the world. And so I think leading by example is one of the ways I do that um, in our industry. And I think I've helped many, many women uh, step up that to the next level saying, I never thought that, you know, I would ever leave the frontline work to, you know, either run my own business or to uh, be, you know, a CEO or be a VP uh, in this industry. So, uh, yeah, um, uh, it's it's a big job continuing to push at it, and uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see major change, in, you know, over the next five six years. That is an amazing um, goal to work towards the front line into more leadership roles. So, I think by even just Speaking that, it sparks so many other conversations of how we can actually take those actions and put them into place. So thank you, Desiree. And Katie. Um, as I said earlier, my personal purpose is um, to create a kinder, more inclusive world. And that's for women, um, and it, but it's also for Indigenous people, minor, other minorities, um, and just people that perceive themselves as marginalized. I think we're at an incredible time in history where all of us at a societal level are going to be called to save the planet and through environmental efforts, but also through social efforts and governance and accountability efforts. And to me, my passion is the S, it's the social one. Um, we're, we're hurting ourselves through a lack of social and economic inclusion 
and women are, you know, obviously um, so impacted in that in that population, and women with other intersectionalities are so impacted. So, I have the benefit of a job with a really big workforce where I can create a role, an example of inclusive leadership inside the corporate world, and I want to use my voice inside the company and outside the company to move other businesses in the same direction. I don't think, um, I, I don't think we're going to be able to save the planet unless we create higher levels of social and economic inclusion, which includes access to opportunities for women at all levels, as Desiree talked about. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Katie. And, you know, I, it's amazing to see how the ripple effect will continue to grow because your voice does matter. And I think that being able to talk about it and just like we shared all of your bits and pieces of stories and there are way more stories to be shared. But when we can step in and own your voice and your worth, that's when you empower somebody else to do the same. So thank you so much, Katie. Andrea. Well, I mean, in my career, um, I would say uh, a few of the big opportunities that I have to create change is through our women's network. We have an initiative of 25% female representation uh, by 2025 in an industry that uh, typically only has about 15% female representation. Um, I'm thankful. Raymond James is a little different. We're close to almost 18.5%. Uh, so we're moving the dial, uh, slow but sure. Uh, so that's one initiative for sure that, you know, I take great pride in and, and try to help with um, through the network. Uh, and then through campus engagement, that's another thing that I do. So I'm talking to a lot of young women um, and letting them know that there's options out there, you know, just because they like numbers doesn't mean they have to be an accountant. Nothing wrong with accountants. But, you know, there's lots of different avenues that uh, women can take. Uh, they just need to be exposed to more information. And personally, creating a safe space for my daughters to, you know, grow and speak their, their peace and their truth and um, allowing them the opportunity to expand their horizons uh, without limitations. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Andrea. And Debbie. Yes, I'm an accountant, actually, Andrea, but I won't take that personally. <laughs> it's okay. I started as an accountant, but then I moved to consulting and restructuring. So I totally hear what you're saying, that you don't have to, you know, be an auditor for the rest of your life. Um, but, I mean, for me, I'm just going to continue, you know, mentoring women as women come up in, in, you know, my teams and my workforce. So even though I work with the Latin American restructuring team, because I am based in Canada, I also get to interact with a lot of people from the Canadian team. And so I actually mentor a lot of them even without outside my service line. So we have different segments at my company. Um, and so I have made a point and I'll continue to make a point to like spend time with them, you know, invest my time, give them my advice. Um, you know, we've done some panels with some other female SMGs because there's not that many of us, but we did get to 100 um, in 2020 at FTI. So that was the goal that we'd set for 2020 to get to 100 female SMGs and we got to that goal. Um, and we're going to hopefully continue achieving that. But well, at least what I can do locally, right? Because, I mean, as much as I want to change the world and there's so much to do, it's like you got to take that one step at a time. So my step is to focus on the people that I can affect or influence or give voices to, power to help them in their careers. And, you know, hopefully that, that just spreads the, the wealth and the, the web, right? And it continues paying it forward through whoever they mentor or, or advise. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Devi. Uh, I just want to again thank each and every one of um, you know our inspiring leaders, uh, all part of our Woman of Inspiration, Woman Driving Change. And I'm sure that all of the listeners that have had the opportunity to hear each and every um, part of your wisdom that you shared will no doubt um, want to read the stories behind all of you. So um, congratulations again to each and every one of you for being a part of such a really dynamic um, leadership book that made number one on the Amazon list three times in three categories. So thank you again, Andrea, Debbie, Desiree, and Katie. Um, we look forward to this epic journey ahead and really continuing to take action to drive change for women to succeed. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Thank you.